There's, there's a you know famous show in the UK that said you know the only gay in the village. Yes. I have a friend who's Little changed brother. it. I'm the only black in the yeah. village. And sometimes it's it's nice when you're seemingly at the top to kind of stay there. But most people are usually afraid of change. When you did decide to leave, was it was it daunting or you were like, nope, I have to no, move on. It was, Let me just. On it to was the next. typically it was very daunting, and you know my mother is unwell, which is very well known that my mother had a catastrophic stroke in 2016, and that that weighed heavily on the decision. Um, to leave because it was it was quite complicated. There were editorial changes that they wanted to make, which didn't suit my personal circumstances, which also didn't suit where I was just in terms of my love affair with news. Like it was like a perfect storm. You know, it was a perfect storm. My mother has been hospitalized for, for a while, for two years now that she's been in hospital. And, um, you know, there just comes a moment where you just have to, you, you hit a crossroads. You just have to figure it out. Does this work for me professionally, intellectually, social, like all of it? And it just didn't work. It just didn't work. And so I said, I'm done. And, you know, the, when you say it, you know, you say, you, you know, my agent called and I said, I'm done. I'm Ooh. out. I said, I'm done. Just fold the deal. And, uh, he said, okay. And my agent didn't even fight me on it. My agent didn't say like, you no. want to think about it? I, I just said, I'm out. Yeah. And um, it, so it was so quick. I'm saying the moment, the break was so quick that he put the phone down and I was like, I've done it. <laughs> wow. Okay. I guess it's over. It really is. And, and then it was done. And I will honestly say this without any, with any, without any, um, Artifice. I haven't missed it. You haven't missed it. But that's because you're doing some amazing stuff, which I'm going to well. get into very soon. But we're about to go to a break. Um, I know that 2014, the um, Nigerian uh, Chibu girls was kidnapped and you did um, reporting there, which really, very powerful. How did reporting on that case, how did that, I guess, did it affect you in any way? Completely. It completely reshaped me. In what way? Telling that story, because I always say, but for the grace of God, I would have been born in a place like Chibok. My mother is educated to an extremely high level, but she comes from a place not much different from Chibok. She comes from a place where they had no running water and they had no electricity. If my mother had been educated, I would have been born in a village, mm. right? So, but for education, but for the transformative power of education and how it can change lives in a generation, my life would have been very different. So for me, those girls could have been my sisters. Those girls are like cousins that I have. And so the notion that A, that they were just trying to make something of their lives in the same way that my mother has successfully made something of her life, they felt like kin to me. And the notion that because they come from poor families that, and they're girls, they don't matter, which is how the story read yeah. initially, just enraged me. And so, you know, there was this whole thing about, you know, moral equivalency or journalistic equivalency, like, but what's the other side? There is no other side to children being abducted. And kidnapped, yeah. There's no other side to a government not doing everything it can to find them. And so for me, when I approached the story, I didn't approach it in a kind of let's like, let's, you know, tread gently. You know, how do you tread gently when 276 children were taken, 219 have disappeared? Yeah. They needed advocates because how many people are fighting for black women and girls? How many people out there are fighting for us? Okay, I like where this conversation is going. I'm going to have to stop you because we're going to take a short break. This is Inspire and I'm speaking with Aisha to say we're going to be back. Don't go anywhere. Welcome back to Inspire. I'm speaking with Aisha Sese, international world acclaimed journalist. And she is just, I love your passion. <laughs> That's all I'm going to say is I love your passion. And just listening to you, it's obvious that you're not just talking the talk, but you're walking the walk. So, you know, I want to just gently move on to sure. We Can Lead. Yeah. So how did that come about? I was at a conference in... New York, about almost three years ago, three and a half years ago, 
And um, it was a summit, for, it was actually Women in the World, the Tina Brown gathering that she has every year. And she did a panel called The Other Malalas. And it was basically spotlighting other young leaders, activists, advocates. And there were no black girls on the panel. And I, oh, and there were. Was it an oversight? Oh, oh, and, and that's the question. I'm not suggesting ill intent. I, I'm, I'm not trying to describe motive. But I sat there and I thought, why aren't there any black girl leaders on this panel? And I thought, we lead. We have the capacity to lead. We're changing things in our spaces. So why aren't we represented on this panel? And that was really the brainchild. I had wanted to do a school initially, and I had many, many conversations with my mom. And then Oprah did her school, and I was like, I was like, Oprah, I can't compete with you. I just, I just don't have the money to have my own hairdressing salon on, on the premises and give my children, you know, $2,000, 2,000 thread count sheets, which I think are wonderful. Amazing. I really do love the fact that she says, why can't African children have nice things? Why can't they aspire to it? And I love that. But I just can't, I can't compete <laughs> with Miss Winfrey. And so that had been, and plus with the school, you have to have all the money at once to be able That's to do it. And it's capital intensive. And it's capital intensive. And so that had been bubbling in my mind when I got to the conference. And then I saw this panel and I thought, there's nothing to stop me building a leadership, a leadership group, a leadership organization, a leadership academy. There's nothing to stop me because that I can do now. Mm -hmm. I'll fundraise and I'll, you know, do everything that I need to. And so I left the summit, let me say at like four in the afternoon. I got back to my hotel room. I called my mom. I said, I'm building an organization. Wow. My mother's used to getting calls from me saying, I'm about to do X. Wow. Her question tends to be, how are you going to do it? I gave her the plan. I jumped in the shower, came up with the name in the shower. Wow. And that was it. The rest is... Well, the rest well, is... It, it's ongoing. The rest is ongoing. <laughs> We're, we surely have about 1,200 children. Um, in, in our program, which targets adolescent girls in Sierra Leone as the first country and the views to get right across Africa.